Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Ammonford Evangelical Church's online Sunday service. It's really good to have you with us. Um, maybe you've done this a thousand times. You know how this is going to go. Uh, or maybe you haven't. Maybe this is your first time with us this morning. If that's you, then real warm welcome. I'm John, by the way, one of the pastors here. Uh, we're going to read a bit of the Bible now. We'll sing uh, in a little while and then we'll pray. And Sammy later on is going to open up the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey on that first Palm Sunday. Because today, if you don't know, it's Palm Sunday, a week before Easter Sunday. I'm thinking about Jesus as king, but a very different kind of king than the kings that we might be used to in this world. Psalm 47 is a good place to start. Let's turn our eyes there. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham, for the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Let's bow our knees before the king and pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the king. We admit and uh, proclaim today that you are the king of all the earth, just as you were for David and for Solomon and the great kings of old. So you are the king who rode in humility on a donkey into Jerusalem to be the one that David looked forward to to be the one that all of the stories of the Old Testament look forward to, the king who would come to reign over your kingdom forever. Lord, that is who you are. You're the one who has your hands on the controls of history. Lord, that's a mystery to us sometimes. That can be a hard thing to understand. And yet, Lord, we want to come today and admit that you really are the king, not not us. You really are the one in the centre, not us. And you really are the one who calls the shots, who... uh, runs the world, not us. Lord, we are sorry for how we have walked away from you, for how we often behave like kings of ourselves, how we often put ourselves in the centre of history, at the centre of our own lives, when really you should be there. So Lord, we ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would help us to see who you really are, to trust you, to come and bow the knee and embrace you as our king, the good king, the humble king, the trustworthy king, the gracious, patient, merciful kind king that you are. Lord, we thank you for who you are and ask that you would help us learn more of that today. We ask you that you would help us to learn more of ourselves today as we come to know you better and that we would know what it is you've called us to do in your service and for your glory and for our joy, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, it's Palm Sunday. For many of us, that will conjure up memories, images of special services in church, of stories of um, palms and courts and donkeys. This morning, as we consider coming now towards Easter and the triumphal entry of Jesus, I think there's so much for us to learn about him and a question that we all need to ask ourselves. So today, we're going to be pondering Matthew chapter 21 and the first couple of verses. This is what we read in Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle, riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went. And they did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and they placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, as I said, there's loads that we could learn, we can dive into in this passage, this familiar to many of us story. But there's just four things that I want us to notice about Jesus, all important things which impact us. And then one question that I want us to ask at the end. We're going to see, I hope, that Jesus is the promised one, that he is the royal one, the humble one and the rescuing one. Did you notice that this coming of Jesus in this particular way is described as fulfilling what was spoken through the prophet? What we get in Matthew 21 then is this um, quotation from the book of Zechariah. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you and he's coming in this particular way. There's also the reference to Jesus being the son of David the promised one of his line. And perhaps if you're reading along through the Bible in a year that Yohan Iwan uh, set out for us at the start of the year, perhaps if you're someone who has read your Bible lots of time, you will know, you'll remember that at various key points, God made specific promises that someone was going to come. Someone was going to come to do specific things. For David, it was the promise of this descendant who would sit on the throne forever, who would rule once again over the entire kingdom and whose authority would never be budged. There was a promise. And as we are looking through the the book of the kings, we're wondering, well, who could that be? Because none of these guys seem worthy. None of these guys seem fit for the task. And as soon as we're introduced to a new king, that king is taken away. There's the promise that was made to David for a descendant that would sit on the throne. There's the promise that was made to Abraham. 
that one of his descendants would be someone so special, so powerful that the, the nations would be blessed. The whole world would be blessed through him. As we've read through the Old Testament and we've encountered various descendants of Abraham, perhaps we've been asking that question, is this the one that God promised? Is that the one that God promised? Is this the one who can put everything right? There was the promise that was made right in the beginning when the curse of the fall came in and God spoke to Eve and said, one of your descendants, your seed will come and put to bed the problems that now exist in this world because of your rebellion. The story of the Bible is the story of waiting for a promise to be kept, a promise to be fulfilled. And here we have this hint that Jesus is the one who fulfills those promises. All those promises that have been left hanging. We hate waiting. But the wait apparently now in Jesus is over. Do you see that? Do you get that? That he is the culmination of these various threads, the, these various identities of an individual that we've glimpsed from afar. Jesus now comes and he is the promised one, the fulfilling one. So what? So what if that is the case? Well, let me ask you, doesn't it feel sometimes like God's promises for this life? God's promises for eternal life in Jesus, they feel like they are a long time in coming, don't they? Sometimes life and situation and circumstances can have us feel like God isn't one who is going to keep his promise. He promised to David and then Solomon comes and goes and Rehoboam comes and goes and the next comes and goes. He promised to Abraham and Year after year passed in his life before seeing the fulfilment of those promises. He promised to Eve and here we are, millennia and millennia later. It can feel so often like God is one who makes a promise but doesn't always keep his promises. And yet if we see, if we understand that Jesus is the one who culminates on all of those promises, that God is a promise-keeping God when Christ arrives, well that should give us faith to trust him with the promises that he's made about our lives that the things that he has spoken about our lives will come to pass to that when Jesus said you may find rest and life feels like a struggle no Jesus his promise is a promise that will be kept of peace of joy of hope of life without suffering and sin and the stinging tears of grief as we encounter death. That's what faith actually means. It's seeing that God has kept his promises in situations like this with Jesus and therefore we can trust him to keep his promises, to keep on keeping his promises. So to see and to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment is really important not just for the past, but for our present and our future. But more than that, we don't just see that he's the promised one. We see that he is the humble one. No, the manner in which Jesus enters into Jerusalem really underscores his humility. That he chooses this simple donkey rather than some majestic horse. I mean, just consider what the alternative may have been. In fact, cast your minds back even to the start of our times in the book of Kings. Do you remember Adonijah? Adonijah was the one who had 50 men running in front of him. That he had this fleet of chariots. That he organised himself all this razzle and dazzle. That it says that he kept on exalting himself and proclaiming, I will be king. There was pride there, wasn't there? There was ambition. There was an attempt to, as we say nowadays, manifest into reality his own will. He had to puff himself up and try to make himself look like a king so that everyone else would start treating him like a king. But that isn't what we have with Jesus, is it? That isn't what we have with this king. We have 
humility on display for us. There's a modesty in what Jesus does. There's a meekness to how he comes in. Not blowing his own trumpet, but simply coming. So what? So what? Well, I think our human experience is actually usually more like Adonai's than Jesus is, isn't it? We often feel the need to big ourselves up, to promote ourselves, to make a song and a dance of our character and our capabilities and um, the things that we have achieved in our lives. We need to publicise and, and proclaim all of those things so that others will see and take notice. Jesus doesn't. He has it in spades, but he doesn't have pride. Pride is actually the thing that we have in vast quantities. And that leads us to some pretty dark places, doesn't it? Of trying to prove ourselves, of trying to publicise ourselves, of trying to, to retain this image that we craft for ourselves. But Jesus doesn't need to fake it. Jesus doesn't need to try and convince others. He simply is. And so there's humility in Jesus. And this is the great news, is that Jesus doesn't need to oversell himself. He simply is it. In fact, really, the thing that we struggle most with Jesus is sometimes we don't see how great and how wonderful he is because we're expecting it. We're expecting it to be there in neon lights. Jesus just comes himself and, and is wonderful. He's the promised one. He's the humble one. And he's the royal one. This story is the story about a king who is coming but a king who comes in a way that is entirely different to what we expect or how other kings present themselves. There's a humility, there's a, there's a gentleness. It's in total contrast to power and authority that we experience. That kingship is pretty obvious in the passage, isn't it? The quotation from Zechariah, see, your king comes to you. That's what we have here. This description that he is the son of David, the descendant who should sit on the throne. But here's what we see is that Jesus is kingship. Jesus is authority, is something that is unlike what we see in our world. He himself described authority in his kingdom as being something that is utterly different to how we experience it in our world. Jesus says that kings in our world lorded over others. That was actually the warning that came with the installation of a king in Israel. God said to Samuel, they've not rejected you, they've rejected me. But warn the people that if they want a king, kings will be people who take from you. Who, who stand on your shoulders and your efforts to build themselves up. But Jesus says no. People lord authority over others in this world. They squash others down so that they can be lifted up. But in my kingdom, my authority is to be used, well, is to be laid down in the service and the building up of others. So when this king comes, it's not to stand over and above others, but it's to be laid down so that others might be lifted up. I want us to see this morning that Christ has the authority to command, but it's not a, co a commandment that is made to enrich himself, but this is the king who we should listen to because, because it's a king who, who serves his people. He's the promised one. He's the humble one. He's the royal one. 
And he is, if you put all of those things together, the rescuing one. I mean, that isn't stated in this passage, but that is the culmination of all those things that we do see about Jesus. That here he comes on a mission, not of war, but of peace. Not of separating, but reconciling. Not of condemning, but of salvation. This is the king who has come in humility as promised to redeem and to reconcile. This is what the people would soon sing about Jesus in the church that he was creating. That he was one in very nature, God. Had it all, but didn't take that and lay it on others to build himself up. But no, set it aside. Not to use that for his own advantage, but rather made himself nothing. He took on the nature of a servant. That he came in human likeness. That he was found to be this fragile man. And he humbled himself. He humbled himself even by becoming obedient to death on a cross. That's what they would sing about this Jesus. That he had come, that he traded it all in so that he could die. Jesus was on his way back to glory, back to his royal throne of mercy and grace. But it was a way that was marked with suffering and rejection and death in our place. So what? Well, so what? That is great news for you and I because we all need the peace that Jesus was bringing. We all live in strife and noise and struggle and condemnation, but Jesus has come to, to bring to us peace, to bring us to where we need to be to the table of the king, to the family of God, to a place of forgiveness and wholeness and freedom. This is really important to see from the story because it's something that we all desperately need. Jesus, the promised one, the humble one, the royal one, the rescuing one, they're all so important. But let me just finish by asking you a question. How will you receive Jesus? Because in the story, he's received in loads of different ways. There are some who welcome him with open arms. They literally lay their coats down before him. They sing this word, Hosanna. It's a bit strange to us. It's more like what we understand the word hallelujah to be. There's just like this declaration, this proclamation of goodness and grandness and joyfulness. There are some in this story who welcome him with open arms. Do you know what is right? It is proper. It is fitting that they do that. It is right. It is proper. It is fitting that we do that. That we say in this sphere of control that we have our own little lives that we say to ourselves and to one another and to him yes he is welcome yes he is king yes he is lord there are some that respond and receive him like at that did you notice that there were others who were ignorant but they were intrigued when he came into the city and the city was stirred they asked the question who is this? Maybe that's you this morning. You've seen a glimpse. You've, you've, you've heard a tale. You've, you've witnessed Jesus in the lives of others around you. And you're wondering, well, who is Jesus? Can I encourage you not to stay in that place of ignorance, but to verbalise those questions? To actualise that interest? To come and to find out and to, to seek him who came to seek you? There are others who are intrigued but ignorant, but they ask and they want to find out more. Perhaps that's you this morning. There are others who will go so far, but will only acknowledge a portion of who Jesus is. 
It's interesting. Perhaps the crowds hadn't quite understood it fully yet. But when they answer that question, who is this? They say that this is Jesus and he's a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They've been making the noise, but they haven't quite grasped the fullness of this promised humble king come to rescue. I really don't want you to stay in that place this morning. To think of Jesus as we so often do in our culture as a wise person or a good example or a clever teacher. No, he is the Lord of history. He is the one true saviour for all humanity. He is the king to whom we should bow our knee. He is the source of life in the face of death. There were others who saw a little bit of Jesus, but not the whole picture. Elsewhere, in Luke's Gospel, we read of some who heard these true things being spoken about Jesus, and they hated it. They positively wanted to reject this truth about Jesus. So as we approach Easter, as we fill our time and our minds and our being with the stories of the one who came and what happened to him when he came to Jerusalem. The promised humble king come to rescue. Can we finish just by honestly answering the question, who do you say that he is? How do you receive him? Do you welcome him with open arms? Do you live your life as if he is the king, your king? As if he is the difference between life and death in your existence? As if he is the difference between peace and strife in your life? As if he is the difference between forgiveness and condemnation in your life? Hallelujah, if that is the case. Or are you one of the others? Are you someone who just simply doesn't know Jesus? Seek him. Seek him. He is there to be sought and found. Are you someone who knows a little bit? Well, they say, don't they, that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. But because perhaps that's maybe satisfied the intrigue that you once had. Find out the fullness of who Jesus is and what he is doing. Please, please, please do not be one of those who hates him. Because if you hate Jesus, then you have misunderstood Jesus. At every point, Jesus is good news to those who encounter him. Don't stop and stay in that place of hate because all you have is death and strife and noise and struggle sin and suffering Jesus has come to set you free from all of those things so turn seek find and enjoy him this Easter amen
suffered and died alone How marvelous, how wonderful am I song shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me When with the ransom in glory His face I at last shall see This will be my joy Dear God, we thank you that you keep your promises. We thank you that though time may pass, your word does not. In the fullness of time, the Christ came, came to earth, came to sinners, came to Jerusalem to fulfill, to rescue and to redeem. The one who came, though rich, came with humility to carry away all our pride, not to lord it over those he rules, but to rescue and redeem those who have rebelled against his reign. His palms mark the way, robes line the road, to your rejection and to our acceptance. Our rescuer received the praise that he was due. And as you have kept your promises, we pray that we would keep close to your promises. When we doubt, give us hope. When we question, cause our faith to multiply. Dear God, we thank you. We thank Jesus. We thank your spirit. We thank you for he who came to us. For he who came for us. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for this Sunday morning service. I hope it's been a really good, spiritually nourishing time for you this morning. Before we go, let me give you a couple of dates for the diary. Well, today is Palm Sunday, if you're listening to this live on Sunday, which means next Sunday is Easter Sunday. But there's a couple of things happening before that. So Thursday, the 28th of March, which is this coming Thursday, in the evening, down in our church building in Amundford, we've got a meal with a message. If you were around in church over the summer, you might remember that Farry came to speak. Farry's um, somebody from a Muslim background. He lives in Swansea now, uh, but came to faith a good few years ago. He came to share his story and to preach to us. I think it was one of the August Sundays that we had uh, last summer. Well, he's coming back and he's going to share his story again and preach the gospel. Tell us why Easter is still important for us today. So it's the kind of event you could bring a friend to, I hope. Um, maybe a friend from another culture, maybe a friend from a Muslim background, um, maybe just a friend that you know or somebody from your family. It'd be a great opportunity to bring them along for a good dinner at half past six and then he'll uh, share a bit of his story and teach us a bit about Jesus afterwards. So I hope you can make it to that. That's half past six at this, um, this Thursday evening meal with a message. And then we've got our Easter services. Good Friday morning, 10 a.m. in Thandabia Memorial Hall, where we usually are for a Sunday, but a little bit earlier. So 10 a.m. Good Friday morning. I um, hope you can make it to that. 
And then Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, a couple of things going on. We'll have our prayer meeting up on Bettis Mountain, up by the windmills, just up beyond Scotch Pine, if you know where that is. Just follow the road all the way through Bettis, up onto the mountain. And you'll find a viewpoint up there with a great view down, up and down the valley. You can see Bettis, uh, you can see Ammonford, you can see all the way up to Bryn Ammon and down towards Llandilo and Llanelli, providing that the weather's good, I guess. But we'll have a good view of the area and we'll be able to pray. Um, for our area. Nine o'clock, Easter Sunday morning, we'll be up there at the viewpoint, and then half past ten, usual service time in the morning, and we'll have our Easter Sunday service, and then that evening, it'll be Dad Ganbod. So there's quite a lot going on on Easter Sunday morning. 9 a.m. prayer, half past ten, normal service, and then Dad Ganbod, Dad Ganbod at 5 p.m. For Welsh speakers, or people who would like to come and support and encourage those who are Welsh speakers gathering to worship in their own language in our church. Oof, I'm out of breath. That was a lot to say, but I hope you caught it all. Thursday, meal with a message. Friday, 10 a.m. Sunday, nine o'clock prayer, 10.30 normal service, five o'clock, Dad Ganvot. Hope to see you in the flesh at one of those. But as we go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord give you peace this week. Amen. <laughs>